Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 and 18 to 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along a path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And then the parable of the sower. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning again. We're making our way through Matthew's gospel. But there's a kind of outline that's uh, baked into Matthew's gospel, and that is this. Uh, five times uh, in this gospel, uh, Jesus speaks, well, uninterrupted for a long period of time. And commentators, when they look at Matthew's gospel, they say these five times are uh, sermons or discourses by Jesus. And uh, we're entering one this morning, Matthew chapter 13. You'll notice it is a, a long talk by Jesus alone. And we learn some things uh, over the course of uh, these uh, words of Jesus. Um, we're going to look at them in four separate uh, sermons. But we, we learn some things about how Jesus is speaking and to whom Jesus is speaking. I want us right away to notice three things. And the first thing is this. You see right there in verse 3, that great crowds are coming around Jesus. Okay, notice that. That's important. Great crowds. It, it seems as though the crowds are swelling to be with Jesus. And that's the first thing. And notice what else Matthew tells us again in verse 3. He tells us that Jesus told them many things in parables. And Jesus now begins to teach in a way that hadn't dominated his speech prior to Matthew chapter 13. He begins to teach them many things in the form of parables. So those are two things, and here's a third thing. This may be more important than the other two. Matthew has already spent an entire chapter, Matthew chapter 12, describing the enormous opposition to Jesus. That's really what Matthew chapter 12 is all about. We see there at least four tests of Jesus. They're tests associated with the Sabbath, but also about who Jesus is as a person, his character, with whom he is in allegiance with. These are tests. And what Matthew is telling us is that the opposition to Jesus is growing and growing and growing. And each of these, in each of these tests, Jesus, he responds with dialogue. He responds by uh, retelling a history of God's people. Uh, Jesus responds to the opposition with reason and with persuasion, but it doesn't matter. Because in Matthew 12, verse 14, Matthew tells us their hearts. They want to kill him. They want to kill him. These three things are so important to understanding the body of Matthew 13. Great crowds are beginning to come around Jesus. Jesus begins to teach in parables, and the opposition to Jesus is at a peak. What's going on here? 
I wonder if we have to look very hard at all in newspapers or on television to discern that there is tremendous volatility in the world right now. I mean, in many ways, even if someone was a complete outsider to our world, an alien who lands upon this planet, would it take more than 10 minutes of news or one newspaper to realize that this place, this planet, is about to burst? I mean, there's volatility everywhere you look. I mean, yes, indeed, it's uh, political, party against party, but also within parties. But it's not just that. The ethnic minorities and, and majorities, citizens and non-citizens, uh, national boundaries seem to be being redrawn right before our very eyes. Uh, there's battle between financial haves and financial have-nots. It's almost impossible not to step on toes just by talking about the current moment in the history of our planet. There is incredible volatility all around us. And if we needed anything more, there is incredible hostility to the church of Jesus Christ. This isn't really a debate, and yet just sometimes saying that can provoke debate because we all seem to be looking for a fight. Now, what's remarkable about this chapter, Matthew chapter 13, is we already know the kind of world that Jesus finds himself in. This uh, parable discourse, it falls right after Jesus has described his own world. How has Jesus described that world? Jesus has called it an evil generation. He's called it an adulterous generation. He's compared his own world with the world of 8th century Nineveh, a massive population who, it would seem, has no interest at all in the story of redemption. Jesus has compared his world not just with 8th century Nineveh, but with a 10th century a land called Shiva, someplace in the Arabian Peninsula, a place that is without the story of redemption. Jesus' world is full of volatility, hostility towards the church, and it's about to burst. There's a real sense in which what we find in our world today is apt for Matthew chapter 13. Because Matthew 13 falls in exactly that kind of world. A world in which it seems so desperate, there's no way that world will be changed. And yet... Jonah was called to preach to that city of Nineveh. And the divine wisdom of King Solomon drew out at least one person from that land of Shiva and the Arabian Peninsula. Hostile world. But something is happening in that hostile world. Now here's, what this, here's what this passage is about. This passage is, it tells us this, that the way to measure the soil of the world is to share the name of Jesus. The way to measure the soil of the world is to share the name of Jesus. The first main point of this sermon really is just to uh, help define some of the terms that we find in this passage that may be unusual. And there's a few that stand out. The first, of course, is a parable. You uh, see that. Uh, that Jesus uh, begins to teach uh, in a parable, in parables. But the Greek word for parable is really quite broad. It could refer to a, a proverb or to a riddle or a wise saying or uh, an aphorism or a fable. It's a very a broad word. And so we kind of have to uh, ponder just for a bit what Jesus means by teaching in parables. And uh, one, one commentator says, look, because in verse 11, Jesus calls these uh, mysteries. You see in verse 11, mysteries, secrets. Because Jesus says that, he's teaching clearly while at the same time speaking in a kind of coded language. And so one scholar says a parable is an enigmatic saying that requires careful interpretation. Jesus is speaking in a way in which you can't just nod your head and walk off with the content. You, you have to stop and ponder, and in many ways you have to unpack it. For now, let's just understand a parable is something that is enigmatic. On first hearing, you need to spend some time unpacking it. And why a parable? Why is Jesus teaching in parables? Well, there's a couple of things that really need to be uh, on our minds. The first is this. The Messiah would teach in parables. 
So when Jesus is teaching in parables, we know that the words of Psalm 78 are actually coming true. This is a marker for the Messiah. Psalm 78 opens this way. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. This is a marker of messiahship. That's the first reason why Jesus is teaching in parables. That's Psalm 78. But there's another reason. Parables are exactly the tool for a hostile audience. And here we're not looking at Psalm 78. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 is where Isaiah is called to ministry. Again, we're jumping back into the 8th century B.C. And Isaiah, he's he's called to ministry by giving a vision of the majesty of the Lord. The Lord appears to him and the Lord's robes uh, go out and and fill the temple. And uh, angelic beings are, are crying out praises to the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Uh, And then uh, the Lord says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, uh, send me. And it sounds like such a glorious scene in which we know what's going to happen next. I mean, Isaiah, he is filled with the majesty of God. And he willingly volunteers to go out and speak to the world. Um, But the words that he is given... Well, they're not the kinds of words that you would expect. God does indeed, in Isaiah 6, send Isaiah out to preach. But God says, uh, Isaiah, keep, say this, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make their hearts full and their ears heavy and blind their eyes. That's the message of Isaiah. And Jesus says what he's doing is what Isaiah was doing in Isaiah chapter 6. What does that mean? When Jesus is teaching in parables, he's showing his messiahship from Psalm 78. But when he's teaching in parables, he's also teaching in exactly that way that is designed for a hostile audience. Because that's the audience of Isaiah. To take a snapshot of of Isaiah's world. You would see a picture of Jerusalem in which people have already expressed their vote about who who, uh, the Lord is and the expectation of of his Messiah. They've already written off God and they've written off his Messiah. That's the world into which Isaiah goes in to preach. And he's preaching in a way that is enigmatic and those who don't understand will walk away, but it's enigmatic also in a way that would draw some people in that they'll stop and ponder. It's exactly the kind of preaching for a hostile environment. So that's why Jesus is teaching in parables, reveals his messiahship, and it's exactly the kind of teaching for a hostile world. And what are these parables about? You see what you're doing, right? What is a parable? Why parables? And then what is a parable about? Well, we're actually told this. You see in verse 19, uh, we're told that uh, the parable is about the kingdom of heaven or more appropriately about the word of the kingdom. That expression in Matthew 19 is very unique, word of the kingdom. And the kingdom is not the church. We would be mistaken to think that's what the kingdom is. It's the church. No, the kingdom is actually broader than that. The kingdom is the gradual influence of God's sovereign rule. The the kingdom is like this this authority of God that is uh, turned up gradually more and more and more. God is asserting that which is already his, that he is the king of the universe. But the realization of that sovereignty is slowly, progressively being uh, turned up. One commentator says it's really helpful to understand the kingdom this way. I mean, really, the the sovereign reign of God is first recognized in individual hearts. And the individual heart hears the gospel, believes in the gospel, and that belief is evidence of the kingdom. And further evidence of the kingdom uh, arises in that person's life because that life, because it's a gospel life, is now a changed life. And now the kingdom becomes operative in their lives. 
And then the kingdom continues to uh, increase uh, in its influence because this individual who is a believer, who is growing in their sanctification, uh, they are led ultimately to complete salvation. Uh, Through and through, all the way, thick and thin, nothing stops their salvation. God brings to completion that uh, which he has begun. And then furthermore, uh, the kingdom of God, his sovereignty, uh, his influence is gradually known, not just in individual lives, but it's constituted as a body of people who come together in fellowship. That's the church body. But that's not the only thing that the kingdom is. The kingdom of God is that reign extending even beyond the life of the church. God will restore all things. He will redeem the entire universe Do you you hear that gradual expression of the influence of God's sovereignty? That's what the parable is about. It's the word of the kingdom. So what is a parable? It's an expression that requires unpacking. Why a parable? It marks the the Messiah and it's the exact tool for a hostile audience. And what are they about? They're about God's gradual influence of his sovereign rule in the world. That was quick, wasn't it? Jesus in Matthew 13 is going to spend some time talking more about the purpose of a parable, and we'll get there. What's the passage about? The way to measure the soil of the world is to share the name of Jesus. Let's let's look at the second main point, which is just the soil. The third main point will be about the word. But the soil first. The parable is not primarily about a farmer. You know that, right? Please tell me you know that. The parable is not primarily about the farmer. Isn't it interesting that the farmer is called the sower when Jesus first tells the parable? But when Jesus explains the parable, uh, he doesn't mention the sower at all. It's not about the sower because the sower is not even mentioned in the explanation of the parable. But clearly, a significant emphasis is the soil, the ground. Four times the ground is mentioned because there's four different kinds of ground or soil. Now, why is this important? Well, you know why. I'll remind you. Matthew chapter 12 is all about the opposition of Jesus. The evil generation, the adulterous generation, the people who hear but refuse to believe. What's the soil about? It's Jesus showing his wisdom of the world. I offered last week that a real offense is not that Jesus knows the heart of the believer, but that Jesus knows the heart of the unbeliever as well. God is the one true king. His knowledge is limitless. And it can be very offensive to some to hear that you may refuse to believe in Jesus, but he does not refuse to know everything about you. And Jesus here is describing four soils that represent this, well, this generation, the world in which he is living. Just think about this very quickly. You know, on the one hand, if we were to do this and just look at the world, it might be pretty easy for us to see that there are some people in the world who believe and some people who don't believe. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, if you were to take a snapshot, you know, freeze everything right now, and, and look at the world population, you would know that there are two kinds of people in the world. A people who Jesus calls his family, you see that at the end of chapter 12. People whom Jesus calls his family and people who refuse to be a part of the family of Jesus. Remember Jesus says, who are my mothers and my brothers? And remember in 12 verse 49, he stretches out his hand and he says, these are the ones, which means everyone else is not. You really could just divide the world between those who are believers and those who are not believers. But listen to what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't doesn't just divide them between believers and non-believers. Jesus actually spends time dissecting those who refuse to believe. You see, Jesus knows that there are believers and there are non-believers. But Jesus knows that there are actually three kinds of non-believers. That's what the soils are about. There's four soils. One is a believing soil. That's the very, very end. But the first three, unbelieving soil. If you're here this morning, you profess faith in Jesus, you need to take great confidence in this. Yes, indeed, you are living in a hostile world that is hostile against the church. Yes, indeed. But Jesus is very much in control. 
He knows every heart. You do not have to sit down and ponder uh, what kind of persecution might be in store for you. It looks like there probably is persecution coming more and more. You don't have to ponder how you're going to be hurt. You don't have to ponder uh, where Christian power uh, gets shoved away in the, his- in the future. You don't have to worry about those things at all. Jesus understands everything about how the unbelieving heart works. There's four kinds of soil. One soil for the believer, and then three that represent those who don't believe. Very quickly, you you see them there. I mean, Jesus begins with uh, the unbelieving soil, doesn't he? Uh, Soil that is a path, which is really no soil at all. Soil that is rocky ground, a little bit of soil. A soil that is thorns, probably a little bit more soil there. One, clearly, uh, right there in verse 19, as Jesus describes it, uh, there's, a, there's a path which is no soil at all. Uh, and Jesus says that this is someone who hears. Uh, notice in verse 19, it's someone who even hears with a certain measure of sincerity. They hear with their heart. But they don't understand. And they understand on some level, but they don't comprehend. They're not aware uh, of the word. And so to them, uh, they hear the word, uh, understand it in some way, but the word simply doesn't matter. The word just doesn't matter. Jesus says that the word is gone, and the imagery of gone is to be snatched away. And what happens to the person who hears like this is they just very quickly end up right where they began. They hear, they understand on some level. But they don't comprehend. And, well, the word just doesn't matter enough to continue. And it goes away. I've heard some apologists say that in America, uh, we're becoming a, a country that, is in, that has uh, been inoculated against the gospel. Uh, we have heard that before. My parents believed in that stuff. or I went to a couple of camps when I was younger, but I'm done with that. I heard and... I thought about it, and I just passed, I passed it along. Why? Well, Jesus says it's because they believe the word doesn't matter. That's the path. And some, uh, some of the seed will fall on, and not the path, but on rocky ground. Here we actually get at least the mention of soil. Uh, this heart seems to be slightly better. There's a bit of soil there. And, and they hear, and we're not told that they hear necessarily with understanding like the soil before. But uh, when they hear, there's something immediate that happens. You, you see that. Something immediate. And the immediacy is emotion. It's joy. Isn't that so much better than tossing it around in your mind and then just saying it doesn't matter? But pay attention. It's not better. Because what happens in their life is the immediacy of joy, the the warm-hearted emotion for the word, it doesn't last, does it? There's tribulation that arises uh, life situations that, that, be, that become difficult or actual persecution. And these things, well, they take the immediate joy right away. And for these individuals, it's not that the word doesn't matter. It's that the word doesn't endure. On some level, these individuals will say that I tested it. I lived with it for a little while. But I'm not that person anymore. We live in a world in which it's very easy to say, I'm not that person anymore. Our world doesn't want you to be that person anymore. And so the word, it simply doesn't, it doesn't endure. For one, the word doesn't matter. And for another, the word doesn't endure. But there's another kind of soil. This is a soil that has thorns in it. But it does seem as though this is even better than the first two. Better than the path because there's soil. And better than the rocky ground because there's a kind of growth. Uh, the word is a herd, but the, but the word actually does something. Uh, it grows. But thorns grow as well. And the thorns, they're not tribulations. They're far more ordinary than tribulations, far more ordinary even than persecutions. They're just ordinary anxieties. You see in verse 22, we could understand them as anxious cares. 
There is a kind of fruit that's being produced, but the thorns grow and they begin to grow faster and they begin to block out the sunlight and pretty soon the anxiety is just too much. And Jesus says that there are deceits of the world. There are uh, seductions like the seduction of wealth. But let's not understand it's just wealth that seduces. The world as a body, as a place in which we live and breathe, the world produces numerous seductions. And whatever it was that grew, well, the thorns outgrow and they choke and they kill. It's not that the word doesn't matter. It did matter, didn't it? And it's not that the word doesn't endure. It endured for a while. But ultimately, the word doesn't win. Do you understand that? These are the three soils. Soils for whom the word doesn't matter, the word doesn't endure, and the word, it doesn't, it just doesn't win. The way to measure the soil of the world is to share the name of Jesus But I can't say this enough. Your Jesus understands any opposition and anxiety and seduction that you experience. Jesus understands that perfectly well. There's no tribulation he's unaware of. There's no persecution that he's unaware of. There's no temptation to anxiety. There's no temptation of seducers that Jesus is not unfamiliar with. We're told in scripture that he sympathizes with everything that we go through in this present age. And that's very poignant for those of us who profess faith in Jesus. That's another soil, isn't it? And so the final point is leaving the soil and turning to the word. The word reveals the heart. How do we know this? Just think about that. How do we actually know this? How do we know that the word reveals the heart? And I want to say quite plainly that we know this because a Christian is someone who submits to God's word. It's Matthew 13 that tells us this about Jesus. Was your heart warmed to think that Jesus might know your enemies better than you do? Did you feel comforted at all, even just a tiny bit, to know that Jesus understands how you feel under the weight of oppression? Is there any comfort at all? It's because of the Word. The Word telling you who God is and who Jesus is. There's so much here about the good soil. The good soil has something similar to the other soils, doesn't it? A little bit like the path. The good soil is a soil that understands, but they go more than mere understanding. They comprehend. They are aware of the word. And they don't say the word doesn't matter. They say the word matters. That's the good soil. The good soil is a little bit like the rocky ground. Uh, the, The word is received full of emotion, isn't it? And there is joy in the word and there is growth in the word. But the word actually survives. Tribulation doesn't remove the word. And persecution doesn't destroy the word. The word uh, doesn't end. The word endures for those who believe. That's good soil. The word matters. The word endures. But the good soil is also a little bit like the thorny uh, ground, isn't it? The fruit grows. Uh, Jesus tells us about the good soil. But notice that Jesus is very clear that the fruit increases. It's not outgrown by the thorns. It outgrows the thorns. The anxiety-inducing cares, they're outgrown by the word. The seductions of the world, they gradually lose their power because the word bears more fruit than thorns. The thorns don't win. You see, the good soil says the word matters, the word endures, and the word wins. Is that you this morning?
Are you confident of those things? Notice that you don't have to be free from persecution and tribulation to be confident of these things. Don't you also see that you don't have to be free from anxiety to be confident of these things, nor free from things that seem to have hooks in you, seducing you? You don't have to be entirely free from those things to know and believe that the word matters, the word endures, and the word wins. This is the Christian now, brothers and sisters, I want us to understand that, that even as we, uh, as we understand that this is the good soil, uh, understand enough to know that we, we are that good soil, we are hearers and believers in God's word, there is a role that we have for one another to remind one another of that word. Because the tribulation and persecution mounts and because anxiety grows and because the seductions can catch us off guard. And as a church family, we're to encourage one another as believers. How do we encourage one another as believers? Is it a ministerial pep talk? Is it elders uh, coming and being uh, bright-eyed and cheery and just painting over your hurts and woes? Is it uh, high fives all around? Is, is it forced smiles? What is it that is going to remind us that, yes, we are a people who believe that the word matters, endures, and wins? We remind one another of the word. We read God's word, we study God's word, and we preach God's word to one another. We remind each other that what the word says is true. Truer than how you feel. What the word says is true. Well, I suppose we should uh, probably uh, ask the question, what is meant by the uh, word or the message? Now, in the explanation of this parable, uh, as Jesus explains it, he uses the word word. Some Bibles translate it message. He uses that word six times. What does he, what does he mean by that? What does he mean by word? You know, when I think about this, as I get to know my neighbors, where, uh, of course, Karen and I are in a new house, um, and as I get to know my neighbors, I'll have a delightful conversation, but sometimes I'll, I'll return inside, and I'll wonder, did I share with them the word? Like I was happy and cheery, and we're building a relationship, and we're talking about things that we're both interested in, and, and I feel like I've made some kind of connection, and it's good to, it's good to know one another, but I, I go inside, and I think, was that the, was that the word? I mean, was that... You think this too. Did I evangelize? Is this pre-evangelism? What, what's happening here? And it's very interesting that Jesus, he's, he's not explicit about answering that question for me. Like, like, I can't go to Matthew 13 and then have this resounding confidence that, yes, when I had that conversation with my neighbor, I was actually sharing the gospel with them. That question isn't really answered in this passage, but there's three things about the word that are prominent. And the first is this. When we ask the question, what is meant by the word or the word of the kingdom? The first thing is this. The word is a man. The word is a man. Let me tell you what I mean by this. Jesus is himself in his body, the great sower. Just think about that imagery for a bit. Jesus is not giving us here an example of what to do. That's not the point of this parable. I preach the word and now you go out and preach the word. There's more to it than that. Jesus isn't just an example of what to do. He's the very point of everything that God does and is doing. Jesus is the focal point. He is the sower with a capital S. He's the point of God's creation, of God's will, of God's plan, of God's opinions, of God's goal. Everything is about Jesus. If there's going to be any relationship with God at all, it is a relationship with a man. I wonder if that's what Matthew means or Jesus means in Matthew 12, 13, 19, the word of the kingdom. The word, first and foremost, is a man-made flesh. We're not talking about a, an, an, an intellectualized or philosophized view of what Jesus has done. We're just talking about who Jesus is. He is a man. The gospel is a man. 
The message is a man. That's the first thing. The word is a man, but the word is also a word. I think there might be a little bit more controversy here. When we say we're telling people about Jesus, we're not merely trying to be nice people. We actually are people with words. Let me give you a very uh, practical uh, example of this. You know, we as a church are feeling our way through what it means to, as a church, reach out to the community, to minister to the community, to serve others. And a primary question is, when we're serving others, do, do they, will they know that, that, that we're doing so because of the gospel? Will there be a word element of that service in any way, shape, or form? That's a very important question. We are a church that belongs to Jesus. And the word that we offer is Jesus himself, but there's information about Jesus that is also part of the gospel content. There is a message, a truth. There is not just an action, there is news, something to share. I feel like at King's Cross, this is an important moment for us. As we embrace a ministry uh, that cares for our community, is it, we need to be thinking about, is it a ministry that also shares a message? The word is a man, the word is a word, and the word is a seed. You know, agrarian imagery is so beautiful, isn't it? But can I just say something about a seed that we really need to call out? A seed is pathetic. I mean, it's a seed. I mean, it doesn't look anything like what it's going to look like in the future. I mean, nothing. I mean, maybe there's a small population of people that can just look at a seed and know exactly what plant or species. I'm sure those people exist. It might not even be uncommon. But it's a seed. It's small, inconspicuous, pathetic. Looks very similar to dust. But the word is a seed. And what that means is that the results of this seed live in the future. It means this seed contains hope. In fact, the seed is never without hope. If the seed turns into something, it's beyond our control. Does that humble anyone? The seed is small and inconspicuous. Its results are meant for the future. But it's beyond your control. There's no plan B for the seed. It does its thing. And if it doesn't do its thing, there's no other seed. This is it. Jesus is clear. The word is a seed. The word is a man. The word is a word. The word is a seed. Let's apply this. Everything about measuring hearts has to do with the word of God. Just think about looking out into our world. And seeing the volatility that's everywhere. Hearing the anger. Seeing the lost lives. If you could uh, turn the world into a heat map, all the little glowing items, they would be life, right? Because it's warm body. But the gospel has its own heat map. And the gospel shows believers and a variety of non-believers. And the only way we know which is which is by sharing the word. Christian, we have nothing else. This is all we have. We share the word. And here is the big application for this passage. You don't know those three kinds of soil, which is the soil of unbelief. You don't know what you're dealing with. How will you ever find out? Is this a path? Is this rocky ground? Is this just a field of thorns? How will you know? Jesus is not obligated to tell you. He has given you the one way. You tell them about the man. You tell them about the word of the gospel. And you tell them about a seed. And you tell them that again. And then you do it again. And you do it again. This is frustrating. 
But this is a powerful message for the church of Jesus Christ. The only way we'll know is by telling the word. And we will feel foolish, but we're supposed to feel foolish. And we'll be interrogated, and we'll be marginalized, and we'll be persecuted. And we'll have to live in this present age in which it's hard to live as a believer of that word. But there's no plan B. This is what we get to do, King's Cross. We get to tell the people the word over and over and over again. We suspend judgment. We wait and look for yet another opportunity to share the word. Because the way to measure the soil of the world is to share the name of Jesus. The word we believe matters. The word we believe endures. The word we believe wins. And that word is a man. That word is a word. And that word is a seed. You want to measure your world? Share the word. Let's pray together. Jesus, we do thank you that you are the great uh, measurer. You know everything about us. Uh, You know all of the wily corners of our hearts. You know everything about us. But you also know uh, the world. And what the world needs is the gospel. And so, Jesus, we pray that you would mobilize and energize us to go out into the world and in the face of any and every adversity, do just one thing. Share the name of Jesus. We thank you in your name. Amen. Uh, This morning, we'll be confessing our faith uh, from the Scottish Psalter. Did you think that you would be doing that Sunday morning? On page 10 of our worship guide is a confession of sin, and because we are one body, we like to confess our sins together as one body. So I'm going to ask that you would join me in praying this prayer. Let's pray together.